Um, I'd like to um, welcome Herbert to come and talk now from Nestle, and um, we'll hold questions, uh, I think, till afterwards is the best yes. thing. And uh, so if you just save those to afterwards, let me know, and we'll, we'll do that, and we'll put a microphone to go around the room so everybody can hear what the questions are and then hear the answer. Okay. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for inviting me. It's really fascinating to be here. And I realized that the subject that uh, was proposed to me is, is quite timely. So I imagine uh, it has to do uh, uh, with, uh, with a really impressive group that is here. Now, uh, just uh, to be clear, I will not talk about uh, US policies. This will be more of a global perspective. You will see it then uh, a bit why this is, uh, uh, starting with the water. Uh, second remark, water in the center, uh, as you know, company has also bottled water in its, uh, in its range of products. Uh, it's not about bottled water. Anyway, if you have a question on this, I would also be available. Uh, two remarks on the company. Uh, it was very kindly introduced already. Uh, the product range, uh, of course, includes coffee, uh, soluble coffee, uh, also chocolate, but then uh, at the very beginning, uh, milk product, milk-based products, uh, you have uh, a whole range of prepared dishes and uh, condiments, and as I mentioned, also water. Factories in uh, qu quite, uh, uh, quite a large number, over 80 countries uh, all over the world. The first investment in the developing world goes back to the 1920s. So you see a relatively old company, 145 years ago it was created in a place called Vöve. Uh, it's not mentioned here, but uh, it's really remote Switzerland. We are still there. Swiss are relatively stubborn, uh, so uh, that's where we started and we are still there. Uh, the main point, as I mentioned, when talking about biofuels and such, and, uh, uh, and uh, sustainability, the main point that we make is about water. Here you see the water situation first as it is today in an analysis that was done in uh, 2030 Water Resources Group. That brings together IFC, uh, eight companies, international companies from uh, also US and, uh, and Europe, and uh, McKinsey as the, uh, the, the thinking force behind. Now, uh, what you have to understand in water, it's, uh, it's a quite specific kind of substance. It's not just, you cannot go for the total water available. You need water at the right time, in the right place, in the right form. So basically when you have uh, enough water in, uh, in India, for instance, in the Brahmaputra Basin in the, in the east, doesn't help when you run out of water in the Indus Basin, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is further west. Uh, some people have then the crazy idea of building a big canal, uh, which usually uh, creates more waste of water than it uh, actually brings to the place where it should come. With this basin uh, approach, looking at each one, uh, the uh, result, the outcome was, as you see, water withdrawals in 2005 in the order of 4,500 cubic kilometers. Actually available again, in this water base, a water basin based approach, 4,200 cubic kilometers. So there is already today an overdraft in the order of 300 cubic kilometers. Where does it come from? It's very much at the expense of nature. You may have seen pictures of Lake Taral drying up. It's, it's frightening. It's, uh, it's about uh, one tenth of the size it was before. You have like a desert of sand that is mixed with pesticides because up there, the overuse was also bringing water in or the remaining water heavily uh, overused by agriculture uh, with uh, uh, heavily uh, uh, in poisoned water. And uh, you have rivers that no longer reach the sea. And something you don't see, you have falling water tables. Underground water <coughs> in some areas, in uh, areas where we are active, uh, one meter per year because farming is using this water and you see uh, the water withdrawals, most of the water goes into agriculture, about 70% of water withdrawals. When you calculate on a per capita basis, it's something like 2,500, maybe 3,000 liters per capita, compare it with the water that you drink per day. This is where it really matters. 
very important also water that goes into industry, about half of it for energy production, mostly cooling. I will come back to that. And then, of course, also household water, a small bit for drinking most, uh, for all kind of other activities of drinking water, of drinking fresh water, uh, including watering your lawn and uh, washing your car. Growth rate, we are already in an overdraft. Growth rate in the order of 2% per year as an estimate for the next 25 years. This is not extremely high. You have already 1% population growth during this time. So uh, you have then, in addition, a changing diet with prosperity. People are eating more meat, which means you need more water to produce the, uh, the necessary foodstuff. The order of magnitude that you get an idea, you have between half and one liter per calorie of food that comes out of plants. So uh, vegetarians, I think, uh, are very prudent about the water. When it's meat, it's about 10 liters. This is the order of magnitude per calorie that you eat. So you have this driver of growth. Then you have energy consumption going up. We have the uh, rough estimate today again on a per capita basis, 150 to 200 liters per capita of world population that is used for cooling. Uh, when you see the, the, the trend again with prosperity, energy demand uh, with all kind of thermal energy, uh, this will go up uh, by 2030 to some, 80, uh, some 800 to 850 liters. So you see the increase and you see the pressure also on the agricultural side uh, the 6,900 cubic kilometers that are in the forecast up here, uh, there you can no longer uh, rely on the nature, which is already damaging enough, to, uh, to make sure that uh, water still uh, uh, covers the uh, necessary needs. That was the wrong direction. This one was the right. And uh, this, is the, this is the threat that we see. Uh, as I said, it's already damaging enough that, uh, that nature has to compensate for the water overuse. But uh, next step, the most probable step is with this kind of overuse that uh, in a kind of uh, status quo extrapolation is expected for 2030. The main factor or the main contributor will have to be agriculture. So uh, the scenario here is you have on the left hand side, you have these watersheds, you have them divided up. Uh, about 30% of the watersheds uh, in this scenario will have a water overdraft of more than 100% or less than 50% is actually uh, covered anymore with uh, naturally renewed water. And you have a large amount of uh, watersheds producing cereals, producing our basic foodstuffs where uh, up to 50% uh, uh, of the water is not, uh, not renewed, so uh, with wide fluctuations. And already in 2003, as you see this quote from the International Water Management Institute, the, uh, the, the, the perspective came up that uh, within 10, 15, maybe 20 years, we have to uh, expect shortfalls in cereal production in the order of 30%. That's, uh, that's dramatic. I mean, you, uh, you have seen the events, also political repercussions of the food price increases 2008. 2008 was the biggest drop we ever had in human history. And still prices went up for a number of factors. Biofuels are one of them. We'll come back to that. But uh, this kind of scenario, this kind of water stress, I think needs to be urgently addressed. I will not have the time here to talk about the the solutions that uh, this water resources group proposes, there are solutions, problem can be solved, but it needs to be addressed now. Now what in a way is uh, frightening us is that instead of uh, uh, really addressing the issue, one is adding to the issue and uh, one of the worst uh, additional threats for uh, availability of water are the biofuels, are the biofuel production. Uh, you remember, uh, let me give some explanation for this chart. This is coming from the U.S. Department of Energy. It's not very recent anymore, but the orders of magnitude are still valid. It's from 2006. What you have to see first, that below here, you have a logarithmic scale. This is the uh, usual way. I'm an economist by training. This is what you do when you want to show 
or when you want to play down the, the differences. So each time it's 10 times the size. Up there you see, uh, on top you see the, the water withdrawals necessary to produce biodiesel. That is the typical product in Europe. Below uh, it's the water withdrawals necessary to produce uh, the uh, ethanol, corn-based uh, ethanol. And uh, you remember the orders of magnitude that I gave you about half to uh, up one liter per calorie for obvious reasons, it's more or less the same for, uh, uh, for the biofuels. And uh, calories is a measure for energy. You can use it either as food or you can put it in your car uh, to drive around. Now, what is essential uh, when you take this calorie calculation is that uh, the energy market is considerably bigger than the food market. When you really calculate in, uh, in calories, energy uh, as used by us uh, in all its forms is about 20 times the size of the food market, which in other words means if you want to replace even a very small percentage of the energy by biofuel, you have already a dramatic impact on the food market. Now, just to come back to what I said before, the water scenarios that I showed, they are not including this biofuel story. This is in addition to it. So we have already a very difficult and uh, difficult to solve, uh, to be solved situation. To this are added this kind of uh, ambitious targets. And uh, as you will see, it's not only US, uh, you have US and Europe who took a leadership in this. Uh, I don't think a positive leadership, but you have a number of countries, some of them in very difficult situation already today concerning food, concerning water, like India to an extent also uh, China. They follow on the same track. And uh, when you have this kind of perspective of worldwide withdrawals uh, of water to produce, uh, the, the raw material to produce fuel, when you see also the worldwide situation, I think it needs the, the reaction, and this is uh, a reaction of a company that of course we are directly interested, we are not producing food, we mm -hmm. are transforming food that is produced by the farmers, but we also see this crisis uh, as something that would threaten more than just our, our own uh, industry. It would be a threat, this 30% shortfall in food production and beyond with this kind of uh, of targets as, uh, as you have across the world uh, that would go far beyond our sector. Now, uh, even beyond these kind of targets, you have uh, international targets, some of them formulated by IPCC. When you look at the orders of magnitude, by the way, uh, it's, uh, it's the adaptation report about 10,000, not 10,000, 1,000 pages. Uh, 10,000 would be at, uh, not easy to, to, to bring in one book anyway. But when you see the kind of targets that are proposed there, the word water isn't even mentioned. So you, it's, it's just single, uh, single <coughs> indication, uh, single issue uh, kind of policy. Uh, very recently, WWF also proposed uh, a way to, to get uh, entirely into a renewable, uh, which is uh, what sounds small, 7% of total energy consumption 2007 at the peak afterwards it declines at the peak being uh, used for, uh, uh, for biofuel. That would mean an additional production of 3,400 calories per capita of population. What is today available as you see to the below and we still have uh, enough people that are uh, going hungry to bed, what is available today is 2,900 calories. So uh, let me close with this remark. Uh, the biofuel uh, in a small scale has a role to play. Biofuels can be uh, useful uh, when you use waste, but uh, if you really go for the large scale, uh, you should consider the repercussions on water in the first place because we think it's a critical factor. And as a result on the food situation worldwide, because food is not like rubber or, or, or copper, it's not the raw material, it's something that people live on. Uh, very last uh, comment, uh, many people uh, have high expectations on the second generation biofuels. Uh, there are some myths around. 
because uh, what you usually hear is, uh, and you see it with the picture, some kids going out to the woods collecting uh, the, the, the fallen wood uh, to bring it then to a biofuel factory. I'm slightly overdoing the point, I know that, but uh, to illustrate, uh, the reality is something different. You see how small the uh, actual amounts will be. This is, uh, these are estimates for Germany. You probably have uh, as good or even better numbers for the US. What actually could be contributed with uh, straw, grass, and uh, other remains from harvest, wood. But look at the volumes of uh, uh, 24 million dry tons, what the logistics would require, what kind of logistics would be required to bring that to, uh, to a biofuel factory and then some from the manual. The reality for uh, second generation biofuel is the picture below. It's a special type of corn, so-called uh, so energy corn, uh, about twice the size of standard corn. Uh, again, uh, we looked at the water withdrawals. You will come, maybe it's a bit less uh, when you also use the, uh, the, the, the main part of the plant, but it's not much less. But uh, I think uh, there are, uh, I realize that uh, this organization also looks at biodiversity. I'm not a specialist on it, but uh, as, a, as a first reaction, when you imagine these huge fields of two meter high corn only produced for energy, uh, in the necessary amount just to replace maybe 5 or 10 percent of energy today, uh, this will be as devastating as the first generation biofuels. So uh, really in conclusion, I think uh, policies here have taken some shortcuts. It will be necessary, but that is, as I said, not only concerning US, it's a worldwide uh, uh, topic. It will be necessary really to reconsider and to see to what extent this is sustainable and actually helping with the problems that we are facing. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think I gotta bend over here a little bit. Um, well, I guess we'll do some question and answers uh, uh, now. If anybody, I think we've got a roving microphone. Um, if anybody wants to start us off with comments, questions, Editorializations. Um, I know there's got to be some questions here. Last time, yeah, here. <laughs> Hi, Irene from Representative McCollum's office. The drive for biofuels obviously is coming from because of oil dependency and countries wanting to, you know, achieve energy independence. And this is one way the thinking goes, and that's why we have all subsidies, both domestically and internationally. And so, I mean. I understand your critique of it from the water and the food perspective, and I'm just wondering how that ties into this debate that we're having, given the $4 gas prices and you know the industry saying that this is what's needed, the renewable fuels industry saying this is what's needed um, to help us, you know, because because of all the problems that we have, we know with oil addiction. I don't know about the uh, the, the cost of. Uh, of biofuels here in the U.S. I know about it in Europe, and they are more competitive. So, doesn't help on the on the cost side unless you put in heavy subsidies. And some of these subsidies are, are quite smartly hidden. Case of Switzerland, for instance, you have uh, tax on fuel that is meant to uh, to cover the cost of building roads. Uh, for biofuels, uh, there are no uh, no of none of these taxes uh, levied. Now, I, I wonder whether these cars are flying. I, I think they are also, even with biofuels, are using the road. So this kind of hidden subsidy helps to an extent. Oil dependency, that was my point that I wanted to make. Uh, uh, even very small amounts of energy being replaced by biofuels will have a so devastating effect on the water situation, on the food situation, that uh, really uh, that it should be considered. You cannot. Uh, imagine to cover 20% uh, uh, that would really have an impact. Uh, it would be about uh, a four, time the, the four times the food production in water withdrawal, in total agricultural production. And we are already today, we are uh, at the limit in many instances of food production. So this is, uh, this is no way out, even, even if, uh, if for a moment or for a short time uh, it may look relatively good. Uh, maybe one point, uh, I'm also talking more from Europe, uh, European perspective. Uh, you have not only uh, the, uh, 
the, 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 the supply security, but you have also agricultural policy involved and uh, uh, farm policy, and you know about the amount of overall subsidies uh, that go to, our, uh, to European agriculture. And this is uh, uh, quite a non-holy alliance uh, of, of two different uh, groups of interest. And uh, the outcome uh, of this kind of alliance is what, uh, what I showed. It's not uh, neither more security nor uh, farmers are disappearing anyway in Europe. Uh, it's not helping. It's just slowing down the process and kind of make believe to a large extent, but with extreme damage. Salt water. Oh, I'm sorry. Excuse yes. me. It is, have you looked at those at all? If you're using salt water, I assume it's not the same. This thing. is uh, third generation, and there is some opportunity. Right now, of what I know, uh, cost per liter of, uh, of raw, uh, raw uh, oil uh, is some $12. So it's not really very competitive. But uh, there is opportunity in that. It would uh, need less surface. Uh, it would need certain amounts of water because you have to uh, refresh it systematically. You have to bring the minerals constantly to the, to the algae. Uh, so there is opportunity there, but it needs quite some time to come first to a competitive price level and to a sustainable, uh, sustainable process. Up to now, it's not sustainable at all, the, 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 the parts of knowledge that I have. Okay, we're trying to get dessert out here. <laughs> um, my sign language is not very good. Um, any other uh, questions? Sorry, I, I don't have my uh, glasses or my contacts on. <laughs> Josh Shankman from Center Wines Office. Um, you commented about the impact of biofuels and water and the long-term yes. food supply situation. Could you also comment on the more immediate impacts on food prices and what uh, the impacts of biofuels are in terms of along with additional demand driving up the price. Uh, especially in the, in the 2008 crisis and to an extent repeated today, you had a number of elements coming in that uh, pushed the food prices up. Uh, you had as a basic element, you have uh, food uh, per hectare productivity uh, slowing down the growth is now below the population growth. That's the underlying gap that you have already. You had in 2008 early, you had the announcement of Saudi Arabia to no longer use fossil water that is in the desert. Don't know whether you have al already flown over the Saudi Arabian Peninsula. You have in the middle of the desert, you have these circles of irrigation. It's, it's Kafkaesque almost. And this is fossil water that was pumped up. In 2008, the government decided uh, in January, we will no longer use this water. It's more valuable than the oil. And the third element are clearly biofuels. And I think more than the actual use of the, of the, of the product and the announcement, because the, uh, what one usually calls uh, speculators, uh, they react to expectations. And the expectations created in 2008 with the announcement of the targets that I've shown you in different governments push the prices up. And this is again the case today. You have now the link of uh, food prices. You had it already before to oil price because uh, uh, oil is an input uh, directly or through fertilizers. But now it's also the uh, impact of uh, the, the, the substitution impact. So uh, again, it's biofuels and expectations on biofuels. I should underline that because often you hear from governments it's only small amounts up to now that are produced, but the expectations are really having a damaging impact. And uh, you see the prices where they are today and uh, you see the political repercussions. I mean, the, uh, some of, the, uh, uh, some of the, the, the things that started in Middle East were originally triggered by, uh, by an increase in food prices. So it's, it's really, in a way, it's playing with fire in that case. Because as I said, food is not copper. Food is, uh, is not, not rubber. Yeah. How much of what you're trying to say here is, is, is crop specific? Because I can see how you, how, how you make your point when it relates to corn, but there are certain 
crops that are used for biofuels that produce a, a much greater amount. I see you shaking your head already, so I could also almost now stop talking. But that's okay. But you, now you. Um, I mean. <laughs> but but take things like like in, in Brazil they use sugar sugar cane, which yes. is much more productive um, per per acreage than than, uh, than than corn is in in developing energy. And then there are, then there are other sources of of biofuels. Um, which are less um, land intensive and and less water intensive. Um, one one crop is jatropha, which can be grown on marginal land with less water. Um, then there's the the development of what's called cell uh, or or uh, cellulosic ethanol, where it can be where, where the science can be developed further along the lines so that it can be more efficiently produced and use more of the more mm -hmm. more of the crop. How much does that affect your analysis, a crop dependent or a science and dependent approach on with other crops? Uh, indeed, uh, the, uh, the biofuels based on, uh, uh, on sugarcane is somewhat, gives somewhat better picture both in, uh, in water and in, uh, in actual impact on, on CO2. Chatropha by no means is water efficient. That's about 10,000 liter per liter of oil. So it's even worse than, uh, you may remember what I showed before, than uh, the typical uh, typical biodiesel produced in Europe where it's up to 9,000 liter. So chatropha, and especially when you want to uh, grow chatropha at, uh, at a large scale that it has an impact, it's no longer just marginal land. What you have with chatropha is uh, this small scale production. Uh, you can have it as hedges between fields, uh, that's, that's what I meant. That can be positive, very small scale, and using some, some land and, uh, and, and situation where, uh, where it doesn't really have an impact on the food production. These hedges have even a positive impact because they protect uh, the land uh, against the wind, uh, a few other functions that they have. But as soon as you go to a more meaningful production, and that starts with half a percent of, uh, of energy or one percent of total energy, you get into a completely different dimension. As I said, the water intensity of Chatropha is even worse than for most other products. Before, before we have another question, I, we always try to get people out of here at 1.15. If anybody's got to go, they're, they're, they're welcome to go. I, so, um, but uh, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take more questions as, as, as people want to stay. So you, if you'd like to have a question right here, but. Hello, sir. I'm uh, Dante Pope from the Office of Congressman Davis. We represent the uh, state of Illinois, uh, which is a portion of the Corn Belt. So yes. uh, corn and jobs are very parallel there. Uh, what alternatives have you seen in Europe to replace the, uh, the uh, biodiesel or biofuel subsidies in relation to jobs? Because if we take away the, the, the uh, subsidies here and that production, you're talking major job loss, specifically in the uh, Midwest. So what would you suggest we could do? This is now more of a company perspective. Uh, we, have, we have had uh, a cooperation directly with farmers. Uh, we have direct cooperation with about 600,000 farmers worldwide. And uh, the, the two things that we do is uh, help with uh, productivity, uh, help, uh, I mean, the, the, the main product that we buy from farmers is milk, milk-based product. Uh, help with the quality. Uh, we pay a higher price for a lower bacteriological status. And then the third element, uh, help with a higher value added. This sounds now very general, but it's, it's in small bits and pieces. And uh, one of the story that we just discussed a moment ago is in coffee, and I know that wouldn't work for your constituency, but it is, uh, it is a, a, a product coffee in, in capsules, ready-made capsules, where you can really go to the top quality. And you suddenly you have coffee in a quality like you would have in the wine in uh, like a Bordeaux. And uh, this quality <coughs> is already bought from the coffee farmer at a very high margin. It's some 20 to 40 percent higher than uh, top Arabicas, the, 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 the top type of coffee. And then it goes through the whole value chain in the end, like a top bottle of wine, uh, that the consumer has a much better, uh, much more pleasure with the coffee. It's, it's really, it's in blind tests. It's no problem to, uh, to find out the difference. Uh, these are, uh, it's, it's a very general answer because uh, I know that 
farming community in almost all of the develop, uh, developed countries are decreasing, are having difficulties to survive. That's the same in Europe with much higher subsidies. It doesn't help with the subsidies. Uh, some way out is with higher value added, is with, uh, with higher productivity, uh, is with meeting even better the standards of the consumer. This is only half a way out, I agree, but uh, cannot give you a complete answer. All very good questions. Um, any other uh, questions? Obviously, our uh, guests and some other people from Nestle and our partners are always here to um, discuss this afterwards as well. I will let you guys know if anybody wants to see. Uh, we are um, filming this in HD, and it will go around to everybody's email after this, as well as other people on the Hill. Um, and they'll also have the PowerPoints available. That'll be in a couple of days, and you can see it on our website, but we'll also send it around to all your emails. Um, if there are no more questions, then I think we're uh, going to break this up. <laughs> um, have a very good uh, weekend, and uh, look forward to seeing you guys soon. Thank you.